Good afternoon. On behalf of Pella Medical Center and Spartanburg Regional Healthcare System, I welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm Lindsay Lewis, the Interim Manager of Community Outreach. Our speaker today is Michael Pryor, a board certified urologist. Dr. Pryor received his medical degree from the U Medical University of South Carolina and completed his residency at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Urology. If you have any questions in the upcoming presentation, please type them in the Q&A box and I will ask them to Dr. Pryor at the end of this presentation. And now it's time for the beginning of our presentation titled Stone Cold Facts About Kidney Stones. We're very pleased to have Dr. Pryor join us today for this presentation. Welcome Dr. Pryor. I'll now turn this presentation over to you. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you guys for uh, joining and logging in. So I'm going to talk about something that's very prevalent here in South Carolina and Spartanburg is, is kidney stones and um, it's a it's a something that I see every day of my life with with my patients that I see in the office and also at the hospital. So um, what is a kidney stone? Well, a kidney stone is basically a uh, stone that forms in any part of the urinary tract and I'll show you a, a, a demonstration of that in a few few moments. How common is it? It's extremely common here in um, in the South. Uh, the lifetime prevalence of someone having a kidney stone in, in this country is about 12%, which means about one in eight people will experience a kidney stone at some point in their life. Males are more commonly affected than females, although the female incidence of this has been rising over the past couple of decades. It's more commonly seen in whites as opposed to blacks. And in this part of the country, the, the the southeastern United States and the, the central southern United States is known as the stone belt because of the uh, increased incidence of kidney stones we have here. So I mentioned the stone is uh, uh, it can be found in any part of the urinary tract. So on your di display on the left is a normal urinary tract, which uh, the kidneys are the manufacturer of the urine and the bladder towards the uh, end is towards the bottom is the uh, reservoir or stores the bladder. So imagine the kidney being a, uh, a fruit, like a melon. You have the thick part of the, of the melon, the part that you eat. You have a thick part of the kidney. That's the part that filters our fluids and will eventually turn that into urine. And the urine is, um, will, be, will be collected in the hollow part of the kidney and will be transferred from the kidney to the bladder by way of a tube called the ureter. And the ureter is sort of the, uh, the transport tube or the highway for the for a kidney stone to, uh, to, for the urine to go to the bladder and also for a kidney stone to get up, to, to become obstructed. So on the demonstration on the right, there is uh, the kidneys at the top the, and in, in the kidneys, there's uh, the kidney stones that are uh, shown by the uh, pointers. Uh, stones can be very tiny. They can be as small as a piece of uh, a grain of salt. They can be uh, the size of my fist. The kidneys are about a fist size organ anyway. And, uh, uh, if a stone is big enough, it can occupy the entire kidney. And the one called the staghorn calcus on the uh, the left kidney on the right uh, demonstration shows that kidney occupies the entire kidney. It can also uh, involve just certain parts of the kidney. But when a stone drops into the ureter, that's usually what will cause symptoms that we'll discuss in a few moments. So a common question I have from patients, usually after they've had a stone is, is what caused my stone? And there's usually not a certain independent or, or, or single cause that'll cause a person to have a stone. It's, it's usually multiple factors, but in general, there's two basic principles that result in stone formation. So the urine is made up, made up mostly of water, and in that water, uh, there's certain crystal forming structures that can be different minerals, salts, usually as calcium and oxalates and uric acid. There's others that are in there. When those non-liquid structures accumulate, they can stick together and become a kidney stone. And the urine also has substances in it to prevent these structures from sticking together. So if there's a lot of the crystalline substance, those can form stones. If the urine doesn't have the substance that prevents it from sticking together, even if it's not a lot of crystals, you can still form stones. So those are the two basic premises that result in kidney stone formation. What are the risk factors? And the, the number one risk factor is dehydration. It's just not taking in enough of the correct amount of fluid, which is water. 
So dehydration and limiting your fluid intake is the number one risk factors for a patient getting kidney stones. Family history is also uh, is a risk factor. Often that's because we, are, we live in the same part of the country that our, our, our parents did. Once again, we are in the stone belt here in the south. So if you live in the south, that's a risk factor for stone formation. And there's multiple reasons for that. It may be the climate. It may be what we eat. It may be the soil composition from that, that, that contribute to the, the, the uh, to the foods that we eat. There are certain diets that can result in uh, kidney stones. The high protein diets are the notorious diets that result in kidney stone formation. Patients who uh, ingest a lot of, a lot of salt, uh, who don't limit their sugar intake, they also have an increased risk for kidney stones. Body size and obesity has a significant impact on the patient forming kidney stones. Patients who are more obese have a higher risk factor for stones patients who are, who are of normal body habitus. Ironically, bariatric surgery or surgery for, for obesity to help prevent obesity or, or help treat obesity um, could also result in uh, kidney stones. Inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis are also risk factors for kidney stones. Patients who have gout have about a 25% chance of having stones. Um, patients who have uh, a hyperthyroid, this or a, a parathyroid, this overactive, it's called hyperparathyroidism. That will also increase your risk for kidney stones. There's also a metabolic abnormality called cystinuria, which uh, a mineral called cysteine is not absorbed properly from the from the gut, and that can increase the patient's risk for kidney stones. And then there are certain medications and supplements that can also result in increased risk for, for stones. Topamax or topiramate is a is a no, known culprit that uh, is often used to treat migraine headaches. But as a result, these patients can have an increased risk for kidney stones. Taking very, very large amounts of vitamin C can also increase the risk for, for kidney stones as can chronic laxative use or abuse. So what are the types of kidney stones? Well, there's, there are several types. There's the calcium oxalate stones. That's probably, that makes up probably about 75 to 80% of stones. This is usually stones that are, are we gain from our diet or by not drinking enough water. There's calcium phosphate stones. Um, there's also uric acid stones. That's the, probably the second most common type of stone. Uric acid stones are the ones that are formed in patients who have gout. But you, you can also see uric acid stones in patients who have increased animal uh, uh, protein intake, patients who have chronic diarrhea. Certain genetic disorders can result in uric acid stones. Cysteine stones are the type of stones that are produced from patients who have cystinuria. Then there's also the struvite stones. And struvite stones are stones that are usually formed in response to urine tract infections. And as a result, these stones get quite large and they can cause more infections themselves. So it becomes a uh, cascading event where a patient has a UTI because of the stone, you have because of the stone, you have a UTI, and it just keeps going through that same vicious cycle. There's, there's other types of kidney stones. They're not that common. Xanthine stones, um, tramterine stones, those are not typical stones. Most of them are going to be calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate stones. Often patients will tell me, well, I had a jack stone. That, that, thing, was, that thing hurt really bad because it was jagged and it had uh, spikes on it. Well, there's different shapes and sizes of kidney stones. They can't, the, top, the, the top photo is a, is a typical appearance of a jagged stone. The bottom one is a, is a smooth stone. It doesn't matter really the shape of the stone. The, 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 the premise is that you become obstructed from something in your urinary tract, uh, which is a stone, and that obstruction causes pain. And I'll discuss that in the next couple of slides. Size itself doesn't necessarily matter for a stone. It may matter for a, a stone being passed easier or not, but any size stone can hurt, whether it be two millimeters or 22 millimeters, whether it be jagged or smooth, it doesn't matter. So what are the symptoms of a kidney stone? Usually uh, a stone that's just sitting in the kidney and is not causing any kind of obstruction won't cause many symptoms. Now that's a routine smaller stone. I'm not talking about the, the struvite stones that are the infection stones. Usually a, a stone that's, that's uh, sitting, sitting dormant, not causing any blockage, won't cause problems unless the, unless the stone moves. So the, on the diagram on your right, uh, there's, there's a, you can see the, the normal urinary tract. 
uh, without a stone, and then on the on the, the kidney on the left, which is the patient's right kidney, there's a there's a kidney stone that's, that's uh, present in the ureter. When a stone drops down the ureter, or at least drops into the kidney outlet, this will often result in prevention of urine uh, flowing down the ureter, and as a result, there'll be a blockage of urine, which results in swelling of the kidney, and that swelling results in ureteral spasms and significant pain. So once again, diagram shows blockage of the uh, urine due to the ureteral stone, and that pain can, can usually manifest as back pain. So the typical signs and symptoms for a patient who uh, has an obstructing stone is, is sudden onset of severe flank and back pain. This pain may be in the, the, the flank region, which is just below and uh, behind the rib cage. It may be in the lower abdomen. It may be in the groin or the testicle or the labia. That pain can can radiate it back can radiate back and forth from the flank to the groin. It's often a uh, pain that we describe as colic, which means it's spasmodic or waxes and wanes and may become uh, severe and incapacitating. Sometimes patients will have some burning when they urinate. May have some frequent urination. They often will have blood in their urine, uh, blood that you can see or blood that you can pick up on a microscope. Uh, patients can present with urine tract infections. Uh, for patients who have had multiple urine tract infections, they should be screened for a kidney stone. Uh, sometimes the stone itself, such as a struvite stone that's so large, can entrap bacteria in it and cause recurrent UTIs. Sometimes the urine that's being obstructed itself will have bacteria in it. And because of that inability of the urine to escape, the bacteria in the urine that you're not passing out of your body will cause recurrent infections. When you're having severe pain from a kidney stone and you have the flank pain, um, often patients will experience nausea and vomiting. Worst case scenarios, they'll, they'll start having chills and fevers and this can result in an in a, um, entity called sepsis, which I'll discuss in a few slides. So in the acute setting, patients often will show up in the emergency department or the urgent care center. They often show up in my office. I see kidney stones every day, but any physician's office can see a kidney stone. And when the patient presents, wherever they are, wherever they are they're going to be asked certain questions. They're going to, we're going to obtain a history of when the pain started. Uh, was there anything that preceded it? Have you ever had these stones before? We're going to ask about the nature of the pain, and then we're going to do an examination of the patient. And then typically, the evaluation will include urine studies, which is a urinalysis, maybe a urine culture, and sometimes we'll obtain blood. And the, we use blood and serum studies to uh, make to help make a di help assist the diagnosis or to decide whether or not further studies should be obtained. So often, when a patient is suspected for having a stone, we'll, we'll obtain X-rays, and and typically the a starting point is a is just a plain abdominal X-ray. Uh, the gold standard, however, is a CT scan stone survey because that can often detect uh, kidney stones very easily and much more accurately. That's in the acute setting. In the long-term uh, setting, we go into prevention as, um, as well as uh, elective treatment. So long-term management often involves a metabolic evaluation. A metabolic evaluation is a 24-hour urine collection, often in some uh, blood work. Um, we do a metabolic evaluation for prevention and also uh, from uh, uh, keeping the stones from forming again in the future. Sometimes a stone analysis will help will help uh, with long-term management. Most stones are calcium oxalate stones, so it doesn't help that much. However, if it's a, one of the more rare stones or um, a stone analysis will help us with, uh, with long-term management. Also, you want to identify causative factors. You want to find those risk factors, whether it be not taking in enough water, whether it be eating the right uh, dietary, the, the wrong dietary substances. You want to ask about medications uh, that may be preventing, maybe contributing to it, as well as certain behavioral issues that may be causing stones. So a patient, a patient comes to the emergency room and a patient is diagnosed with a, stone, with a stone. So let's say a patient comes in with a sudden acute flank pain, nausea, vomiting, seeing blood in their urine. And so Usually the, 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 the provider or physician will do an x-ray, you have a CT scan, you're diagnosed with a stone. So what do you do next? Well, the most important thing is a patient's clinical presentation. Laboratories uh, often does, uh, laboratories and x-rays don't often dictate what we're going to do with a stone. It's really the patient's clinical presentation is the most important thing. In general, 
most patients who present to the emergency department or the urgent care can pass a stone without specific treatment. When I mean treatment, I mean surgical treatment. So usually patients can be treated with pain relievers. Uh, there are certain medications that can sometimes be uh, uh, prescribed that will help a patient pass a stone. Um, a lot of providers will tell patients to push water. I don't necessarily do that, but you, there, are, there are some uh, modifications of water consumption that you can do to help pass a stone. Sometimes, however, the pain is too severe or the patient has symptoms that are going to warrant quicker treatment than, than, uh, than just trying to pass it. Uh, if the patient is critically ill or if they're aseptic, which we'll discuss momentarily, that's going to require urgent treatment. Uh, sometimes the pain is just too, too severe and that, that pain is usually due to the obstruction. And, and that's regardless of the size or the location of where that stone is. So you treat the patient itself and not just a, not just a diagnosis. So what are the treatments? So let's talk about the three basic uh, elective treatment options for a, for a stone. There's extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, it's a long word. There's ureteroscopic stone retrieval. And there's also percutaneous nephrolithotomy, also a long word. So we're going to discuss all of those. ESWL, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. So ESWL is a way of treating stones in a non-invasive fashion to help break them up, to make them smaller so that a patient, patient can pass the stones down the ureter into the bladder so they can void the stones out. This is best for stones that are typically in the upper half of the ureter or in the kidney themselves. So the premise is that these ultrasonic waves are brought in from an external source and are um, uh, used to direct directly onto the stone itself. And by different factors that I won't go into, these stones can be broken up into smaller pieces. It's better if the stone is less than 10 to 20 millimeters. Uh, you need to be able to usually see a stone on a standard x-ray to treat it. Um, it's not invasive, even though it's not invasive, it's not without side effects. Most patients will have some blood in the urine after these procedures, but you can also have bleeding around the kidney. Uh, sometimes a stone will break up enough, but not enough to pass, and that can make a stone that's relatively asymptomatic or not, or not causing symptoms to be one that is causing symptoms because it becomes obstructed. So when a patient has extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, we bring them into the a, a procedure room. We do an, a, an x-ray called fluoroscopy, which is like a continuous x-ray for a few seconds to see if we can identify the stone. And then we line that stone up between, uh, we, we, line, we line that stone up with two different angles on the fluoroscopy and we treat the stone with the ultrasonic waves. And that usually takes about 30 minutes. Um, you, you can do other procedures to help augment passage of the stone, such as passing a stent, uh, which I'll discuss in a few moments. Uh, but ideally, these are, these are the stones that are small enough that can be broken up and passed down the ureter into the, into the bladder. Now, I've I, I mentioned that twice, passing into the bladder. Usually, once a stone is in the bladder, you can usually void that stone out through the urethra. The urethra, which is a tube that leads your bladder to the outside world, is a tube that's much larger in diameter than the ureter. So once you're in the bladder, usually you're, you're home free from passing the stone. Not all stones are treated with ESWL or shockwave lithotripsy. Some stones will be treated with a scope. And um, I don't think I have a diagram on that one later. Um, so a scope can be inserted in a, through the urethra, the tube that you urinate through, into the bladder. And then through that, through the, then that scope can be advanced into the ureter tube, which is the, the tube that drains the kidney into the bladder. And this, this scope is very small. Usually the patient is anesthetized or, or, or put to sleep for this. And the stone can be manipulated into the ureter. And uh, if the ureter is large enough, you can advance the scope all the way up to where that stone is. And if the stone is small enough, you can remove it intact with a device called a basket. Now, usually a stone that's in the ureter, you're not gonna be able to remove with a basket because it's already too big to, to pull out. So you don't wanna just yank a stone out. Uh, because you can do some damage to the ureter. So often a laser is used to break up the stone into several smaller pieces. And once the stone is broken up into several smaller pieces, you can remove them with the basket or the patient can just pass them on their own. Uh, now this is more invasive than lithotripsies, more invasive than extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy in that 
um, you're, put, you're putting something in the body. And the risk of this includes damage to the ureter. Sometimes that occurs from the stone itself, not from the scope. Sometimes you can't get the scope to where the stone is. And when that's the case, you'll often uh, put a stent in and come back in a different day. And then the third elective treatment is something called PCNL, or percutaneous nephrolithotomy. This is for the stones that are much larger, so stones that we feel that's going to be too too large for a, a single or, or, or second session of lithotripsy to break up to be small enough to pass a stone. Um, these are the, usually the stones that are in the, in the um, upper part of the ureter or in the kidney. Often these are the st stones that we call the staghorn stones, and they're usually about about 20 plus millimeters in, in size. They can be much larger. 20 millimeters is, is roughly about an inch, but stones can occupy the entire kidney. So this is a much more invasive way for, for dealing with the stones. How this works is that um, usually a radiologist will, will use a small tube to place in the back into the kidney, and then that, uh, then that patient will be taken to the operating room, and a urologist will then make a small incision about the size of a, about the, uh, about a half inch in size. And through that incision, a scope called a nephroscope, which is shown on the page on the left side of the diagram, can be advanced into the kidney, and then the stones can be identified. Now on the right side is a is a diagram of a of a stone, um, actually stones. Usually th this is let's pretend this is actually after the stone's been treated. Usually that's a, it's a big solid chunk of rock. That stone can be broken up into several pieces with a laser or with other different modalities that we use to make a stone smaller. And we put, then we can remove the smaller fragments of the stone, or we can or we can aspirate or suck them out through the uh, through the scope that we're using. And this is a much more involved procedure. It's more invasive. You're going you're you're going through skin to get into the urinary tract. As it has a higher risk of higher risk of bleeding a higher risk of uh, infections. However, it's extremely effective for removing stones, especially larger stones. And we can usually get patients stone free in a single anesthetic session with this procedure as for stones that are very large, as opposed to having to use multiple anesthesias with uh, using ESWL or the ureteroscopic stone removal. So I mentioned stent a couple of times. So what is a stent? Patients often dread stents and, and stents serve uh, uh, several purposes. Basically a stent is a uh, slender or small flexible tube that extends down the length of the ureter from the inside of the kidney all the way to the bladder. And the, the reason we put this is, the reason we place these is that it allows for urine to pass down the ureter. It prevents obstruction in the kidney and by preventing the obstruction, it preserves kidney function. When a kidney is obstructed for, for several hours, several days, several weeks, it can start to lose some, some function. When do we usually place these? Most of the time these are placed at the time of a procedure. Uh, if it's an elective procedure, it will help pass any residual fragments. Um, a stent also helps make, makes the ureter bigger, not just for passes of stone, but if we have to look back up the ureter for a second look. Uh, a lot of times these stents are placed emergently. They are placed emergently when a patient is extremely ill or septic. Um, when we place a stent, they can't stay forever. You weren't born with a stent. So if it's left in too long, the stent itself can cause stones. Usually a stent may, may be left for just a few days. Uh, it's not usually left for several months. Over time, that stent itself will become encrusted and will lead to further complications. So if you've ever had a stent, uh, make sure you have it taken out or addressed at some point in the future. What, what is septic, sepsis or, or being septic? Well, that's when you have uh, an infected part of your body that becomes so, so severe that the rest of your body becomes infected. So there's a term called a urosepsis. That what means a urinary tract is the origin of the infection, and that's usually because there's obstruction. So looking at the diagram on the far right, there's a kidney stone block in this outlet. If it becomes severe enough blockage, that urine that is uh, in the kidney can dissipate or escape and get into the bloodstream. And as a result, the patient can get critically ill, all because of a blocked urinary tract. So what do we do with that? Well, these patients need to be, they need to have their kidney decompressed or, or unblocked as soon as possible. So this is one of the most useful uh, avenues to place a stent where a patient's anesthetized, 
They we use a scope to look in the bladder and we slide this long flexible tube called the stent up the ureter into the kidney. And in, the, in this diagram, you see the stent bypassing the stone. So that allows some of the urine to go through the stent, but also a lot of the urine to go beyond the, beyond the stone, around the stent, around the stone as well, because the obstruction is what caused the problem to begin with. And the first way of treating the, the kidney stone is to treat the obstruction. Once the obstruction has cooled down, often the infection will resolve and then you can treat the kidney stone in an elective fashion. You typically would not treat a kidney stone electively when a patient is infected or critically ill. So once a patient has had their stones treated, uh, we I often will discuss with them prevention and what to do to prevent to, to, to help manage them from getting stones in, in the future. Just in general, there are certain dietary and behavioral modifications that will help. That's basically increase your, your, increasing your daily intake of water, limiting the amount of salt that you take in. You want to limit your oxalate containing foods. Now, the, the food that has the most uh, oxalate in it is rhubarb. That's a potato type of food. I've never had it. There's not much rhubarb uh, in the South. I don't think I've ever seen it at the grocery store. Uh, other, other foods that have rhubarb are tea, nuts, chocolate, green leafy vegetables. Have a lot of that here, have a lot of that everywhere. Uh, oxalate can be found in almost any food product, but those are those are the four or five main food products that can that have oxalate. Now, green leafy vegetables are good for you typically. They have their high in antioxidants, they're healthy. You just want to take everything in moderation. But the th things like tea, nuts, chocolate, a lot, a lot of a lot of that can contribute to increased oxalate formation and therefore stone formation. I also tell patients to try to limit or moderate the amount of animal protein consumption they have, which is basically uh, beef, chicken, fish. Uh, the, the red meat seems to be the, the biggest culprit of the, of the animal protein for, for causing stones. Um, you want to limit and moderate calcium intake. You don't have to restrict calcium. Sometimes restricting calcium can be uh, uh, can make things worse. So just because you have a calcium stone doesn't mean you need to eliminate calcium. I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of calcium supplements for people who are on calcium uh, replacement therapy, which is important for patients who have osteoporosis. It's probably better to be on one called calcium cit uh, citrate or, or, or citracal that, that has a, a, a citric acid, which makes the, the calcium less sticky in, in the urinary tract. Weight loss itself is a huge, uh, uh, factor to help prevent stones. When I'm trying to counsel patients about uh, prevention stones from recurring, especially those who have had multiple stones, I'll often do something called a metabolic evaluation. And the metabolic evaluation is two parts. It's, it's serum studies or blood studies where we look at the basic metabolites, uh, serum uric acid levels. And we also, the second part say, is a 24 hour urine collection, which looks at the volume of the urine, the pH, the amount of calcium, the amount of citric acid, the amount of uric acid. And we use this metabolic evaluation to see if your body is producing something that's causing stone formation so that we can identify that something, whatever it may be, to treat with either behavioral or dietary modifications or even or even medical therapy. Um, a lot of the medical therapy depends on what we see on that metabolic evaluation. Um, there's also some benefit for doing stone composition analysis. It's more of a, as I mentioned earlier, it's more effective uh, to, know the stone, to know the stone makeup or analysis if it's not a routine calcium oxalate stone. There's certain medications that we can use to prevent stones. The uric acid stones are the, one of the few stones that can be dissolved. Uh, cysteine stones are, are dissolvable as well too. Uh, that's all usually occurs by altering the pH of the urine. The drawback about that is, there, is that those are not the, the more common stones. Uh, usually the calcium stones, not usually, but none of the calcium stones are ones that you can actually dissolve with, with a certain medication. So in summary, um, you know, stones can cause symptoms by causing blockage. Just because you have a stone in your kidney does not mean that you need to have it treated. It does not mean that it's causing a problem. It can cause a problem in the future, um, but usually the symptoms result from obstruction. Larger stones, if they're not, even if they're not blocking you, they can cause urine tract infections, and this, that is an, indicated, an indication for treating stones. 
Uh, the good thing is that most stones that bring patients to the ER can be passed. When they can't be passed, there's good treatment options. We discussed the shockwave lithotripsy, the ureteroscopic stone removal, the percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Uh, <clears throat> stone obstruction can be life-threatening. The goal is to relieve the obstruction. Uh, once the obstruction is gone, that's the first step in preventing the infection. Once the infection is gone, the stone treatment can be uh, started. And keys, key ways of prevention is increased water intake, limit intake of salt and animal protein, and weight loss. Um, I want to thank you guys for joining. I'm going to ask Lindsay if there's any questions I'm happy to answer. All righty. Thank you so much, Dr. Pryor, for that wonderful and informative presentation. I know I personally learned a lot, and we do have several questions that I just want to ask a few of them um, while we have a few more minutes. The first question we have, a lot of the questions have to do with water intake. So I know you talked a lot about um, hydration um, with kidney stones, and the biggest key is not being dehydrated. So I guess in, in summary, how much water should each person have each day? Because I know I've heard a lot like half your body weight, 64 ounces, a gallon. So does it depend on the person or is there a general um, amount of ounces each person should have daily? That's a great question. Probably one of the most common questions I get. And um, you know, ideally you want to drink enough fluid, which is typically water. Uh, enough water to make about two and a half liters of urine a day. That's a lot of urine to make, so that means you're going to have to drink at least probably, you know, two and a half ounce, two and a half liters of, of, of water. Now, keep in mind that even the foods we eat contain a lot of water, so you can get water not just from the, the bottle or the glass that you're drinking out of. So, more is better. If you don't drink, you're going to make more urine if you drink more water. Is there a certain amount that you should be drinking? I think that depends on the individual. It depends on your health. Sometimes you, it's not healthy for patients from cardiac or heart re reasons to drink that much water. So what I usually tell patients, and if you ask me how much how much urine I make a day, I couldn't tell you. I'm a urine specialist. I don't measure it, and it's hard for me to eyeball how much I make a day. So what I, I, I tell patients a good rule of thumb, after that first voided specimen, your urine should be more clear the more hydrated you are. So if your urine is darker yellow or, 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 or more yellow than not yellow, then you're probably not taking enough water. The reason that's important is that because making your having more making more urine makes your makes the urine more dilute, makes you have less ability of all those crystals to stick together. So you know I think what I do personally for for stone prevention, simply because I'm scared of stones, is that I drink a lot in the morning, and uh, as the day goes by, I'll, I'll adjust how much I drink based, based on my activity level of what I'm doing. So, you know, more is always better. I, I think, you know, is 64 ounces enough? It might be. I, I think that's good if you can drink that much. Uh, but you want to have enough consumption throughout the day during the waking hours to keep your urine clear for the most part. Keep in mind in the morning when you first wake up, your urine's more concentrated so it's going to be more dark then. So more is better. Is there a certain amount? Well, you want to make close to two liters of two to two and a half liters of urine a day. Okay, thank you. And the last question in regards to hydration is, is it possible to drink too much water? It is. There's there's a, a, a few entities that can, can occur. Obviously, if you have heart disease, uh, if you have kidney dysfunction, they may tell you, they may, your, your physician or provider may suggest that you not drink as much. Uh, is there too much for kidney stones? No, I mean, more water is better. Um, um, I will say that I, I'm, even though the ER physicians will, will, will correctly tell you, push plenty of water when you have a stone trying to pass it, that may help, it may not. Sometimes make, sometimes drinking too much water just continues to make, make you have more urine, which causes that obstruction to be worse. But in general, for prevention, there is, there's not too much for, for stone prevention, but there may be too much for your body's system to accommodate if there's other medical conditions. Okay, thank you. Another question we have is, is it okay to drink coffee, tea, or soft drinks, and what should be my limit if I do? 
I love those because they taste good and they keep me busy. But uh, you know, to, to, to mention soft drinks and tea, so those are those are those are not good. Uh, most tea, whether it be the brown tea, sweet tea, not unsweet tea, they have most of those teas have oxalates in it, and that's the culprit for making the stones. Soft drinks, especially the ones that soft drinks are bad because they're sugary. Sugary, any sugary drink is going to contribute to stone formation. Um, the ones, the, the soft drinks that probably are not bad for stone prevention, um, or are not bad for stone formation, are the Sprite and Sprite Zero. Why? Because it has citric acid, and citric acid may, uh, well, it's been proven to help prevent stones. That doesn't mean go invest stock in Sprite. That doesn't mean start loading up on Sprite. There's nothing better than water for stone prevention because water is without calories, and water helps keep the urine dilute. Coffee, you know, co there's some protective effect, believe it or not, with coffee. Um, if you drink two or three cups of coffee a day, that's actually been shown it may help prevent stones. Now, if you're drinking a whole pot of coffee a day, that might not necessarily be good. The reason the coffee is not good in large amounts, coffee and caffeinated tea, alcohol, all of those in large amounts will cause you to, to live in a, in a constant dehydrated state. And that constant dehydration state is not good for stone prevention. So yeah, I, I do tell patients to drink, to limit their, their their sodas, to limit their tea, you know, limit their coffee only if they're doing excessive amounts. But I also tell patients, you know, if you're compliant most of the week and you love tea, and you love going to the beacon and getting the tea or, or you know, drinking tea after church on Sundays or whenever, make that your 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 day that you reward yourself. So one glass of tea a week or a couple glasses of tea a week is probably not going to cause kidney stones. It's the consumption on a daily basis that results. In. And the same thing can be said with soda. Can be said with sodas. Pat yourself on the back and reward yourself a little bit when, when needed. It keeps you it keeps you compliant with drinking water on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Another question we have is if I've had a kidney stone physically removed through surgery, can I get another? Absolutely, you can. You have a most patients have about a 50% chance of having a second stone in the next five or 10 years. So not all stones require treatment. Just because you have a stone doesn't mean you have to have it treated, especially if you're following that stone on a semi-annual or annual basis. So when you have treatment for a stone, especially if it's a big surgery, then those are the patients I typically will offer a metabolic evaluation to because I don't want them to have another stone. I don't want them to have pain again. So if we can do things to, if we can do a, a metabolic evaluation to uh, identify risk factors, that's very helpful for the patient. And once again, that's, uh, I think the stone composition will, will help sometimes, especially if it's a uric acid stone. Uric acid stones are those few stones that can be treated with um, medications called potassium citrate. And that changes the, the pH of the urine. And if you get make it a, a low enough pH, you can actually dissolve those stones. And uric acid stones are are ones that are notorious from, from recurring. So if you if you're not keeping that urine pH at a low enough level, they can recur re, they can recur quite quickly. So yeah, anybody who's had a stone uh, once has an increased risk for having stones again in the future. But knowing this information about stone prevention, drinking enough water, limiting your sugary drinks, limiting your, your intake of oxalate, that can really lower the, your, your chances of have a stone in, having another stone in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we have says, what is an example of a medication to help pass a stone and what situation would detect using that as opposed to just waiting and letting it pass? So, the... I'm assuming your 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 the question is pertaining to. I made a statement. There are some medications that can help you pass a stone. So, some of the sometimes a stone is going to pass on its own. There's a medication called tamsulosin. There's also some other medications that can be used to help you pass a stone by helping the ureter relax. The so ureter once again is that that tube that goes from your kidney to your bladder. It's the highway that causes stones to to get jammed up. And so by doing medications such as tamsulosin. Um, uh, it will help the ureter relax to help you pass it sometimes. And, and that's some way, is some people don't necessarily believe in that. It's almost controversial. Just as many, just as many studies that have shown that tamsulosin helps 
have also shown that tamsulosin has no bearing on the stone. So yeah, there are those are the medications that we'll, we will often use to help a patient pass a stone. It's going to be um, if a stone is up in the kidney, tamsulosin isn't really going to help. Um, what was the second part of that question, Lindsay? It just said what situation would detect using the medication as opposed to just waiting. So, so you know, it's a patient preference. Now, some patients don't like the way tamsulosin makes them feel. It's not a narcotic, but it can lower your, your lower your blood pressure a little bit. It can make you feel washed out. Um, 20 years ago, we didn't have tamsulosin. The patients have, paid, have passed stones pretty decently. But, but there are some studies that have shown a definite uh, effect. A lot of that is patient preference, physician preference. Uh, another thing that's been shown to help pass stones, at least at least in men, is sexual activity. And, and couples sort of laugh at me when I, when I got a couple in there. I tell them, Google search it. They're, they're actually, sexual activity for men has been shown to help increase the chance of patient passing stones. Okay. Another question we have has to do with calcium. So it says, Limiting calcium as a preventive measure makes me wonder how the regular usage of medications like Tums may cause or contribute to stones. Is there anything to that? Yeah, you know, if, if you don't need calcium supplementation, you don't necessarily, you shouldn't be taking it. Now, if your calcium level is low, then I think that's, it's, it's, a, it's a needed, it's a, it's, it may be a needed uh, component to your body. Uh, you can get a lot of calcium just from your diet and you know we don't typically patients will say well, i don't have any calcium i don't drink any milk i don't drink any i don't eat any yogurt or ice cream but you can those are those are dietary sources of calcium that are typically good if patients are taking you know, 1200 units of calcium a day then maybe that's too much for them their, their system can't necessarily help that or, or handle that and that calcium will become excreted in the urine and this, that calcium will, will build up uh, in the urine called stones. At least it can. It doesn't always do that. I, I, I think a, a better question is for the patients, especially the women who are osteo, have osteoporosis and they're on calcium supplementation. And the calcium supplement, the best one to use for that is citricale or calcium citrate. It's got both the calcium that's needed for the bones, but it also has the citric acid that gets excre excreted in the urine that makes the calcium that's also excreted less sticky. So I think that's something to ask your physician about. Uh, I, 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 don't, I can't recall off the top of my head what exactly the makeup of Tums is. I know it's calcium. I don't think it's calcium citrate. Um, I think that would be something that you would ask your, your provider. Okay, wonderful. And the last question we have um, is, a, I think, more of a personal question that they're wanting some advice on. It says, I have a fairly large staghorn stone that has just discovered in the last several weeks from a scan. I also have a few dozen smaller stones in the kidney. I've passed as many as nine stones in a day. This has all started in the, in the last 12 months after prostate cancer treatment. Surgery is being contemplated in a month. What can I do to possibly avoid the surgery? Well, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one to, act, to answer. I can tell you, I can speak in generalities. So a staghorn calcus will not go away. And, there's, unless it's a massive uric acid staghorn calculus, I doubt it's, it's not going to go away on its own. So, um, does a staghorn have to be treated? No, it doesn't, but we do know that with long term studies, that leaving a staghorn calculus in for several years can really impact your overall kidney function. It can cause kidney deterioration. It can also lead, in worst cases, to death because of sepsis. So, a struvite stone could be there for years and, and you may never even know it until you've had some type of scan for whatever reason. Um, sometimes these patients will have kidney stone, kidney infections as a, as a result of the staghorn calculus. So it, it's hard to, uh, it's not a mandatory surgery um, because you're living with it and I, I, bet you that, I bet you that staghorn calculus didn't start within the past few months. Um, probably not much you can do to, to uh, get rid of that stone without doing surgery. Um, that surgery is usually, we, we do lots of them. Um, the, the success is determined by how well, how good of access is obtained from the radiologist and then also how well we are able to, to 
um, get the scope in to find a stone. And also is determined by the size of the staghorn calculus. Sometimes you'll have to have two, two tubes placed in the kidney at the same time. And that's very helpful. Uh, fortunately, the radiation, the, the radiologists at Sparma region are, are excellent in getting our access. Um, the, uh, the, the, the bigger the stone, the, the more the complications. Um, but we're used to staghorn calculus and cal calculi. And, and, and I, I don't think there's a way to avoid uh, surgery without leaving the stone in place. So I wish you luck. Uh, you have to sort of go by what your urologist or what your doctor advises. Um, I hope you do well. All righty. Well, I appreciate it. And Dr. Pryor, I just wanted to thank you one more time for taking the time to present today um, to this audience. And I just wanted to let everybody know to be on the lookout for our May virtual presentation that should be coming out shortly. Thank you everyone for joining us today and I hope everyone has a wonderful day.